Okay, thanks uh, for those of you joining today. This is our fifth broadcast, and um, this started out, you know, like a lot of you kind of sheltering in place, uh, getting cooped up, uh, trying to stay safe, and, um, you know, it, it, it turns our attention around a, a lot of times to uh, projects that we put off, things that we've wanted to invest in, and, and, and this is one of those things that at Deceleration we've been kind of messing around with for a while, which is this the uh, the live cast uh, stuff and um, but it really turned out like as as people turned inward uh, and we were told that we needed to socially isolate uh, we kind of uh, really pushed back I, mean, I felt like we were being told to, to hold up be alone and uh, the important part important, one of the critical things about this moment we we think is that we stay together that we build our networks that we keep our uh, social connection strong uh, and, and this social distancing thing uh, is um, uh, just language that we want to reject in favor of you know physical distancing all those things that we need to do to stay safe yes um, so uh, so we started kind of like uh, bringing folks on here uh, to do this work um, and I just have kind of got in the habit of doing um, broadcasts at the top of uh, this program I want to close out a couple windows um, uh, and, and just share a few updates with folks um, we've got uh, good folks on here today uh, people that I've worked with quite a bit and in, in the past we've had folks like Brian Gordon on gardening and uh, Sam Kaufman at human path on healing herbs and plants um, really good conversations about housing and housing justice and ongoing um, uh, work around that uh, there's some conflicts happening right now with landlords trying to kind of like siphon out uh, funds that, that the should be going to individuals to, to do what they need to do. And, and um, as, as work becomes more and more tenuous, uh, as food becomes more difficult to get. Um, so uh, anyway, today is uh, we're going to talk with Didi Balmeris from uh, Public Citizen. You can know her a little bit in the campaign around CPS Energy. Uh, and, and, and this is all really utility work. Um, uh, CPS, uh, Energy and Saws, uh, the water system have in San Antonio, both uh, owned by the people, right, ostensibly, uh, have declared they're not going to be shutting off folks' uh, power and water. Uh, and yet what's going to exist on the other side? And there doesn't seem to be a lot of thought going into what exists on the other side of the, the peak of, of, of the crisis we're in right now. Um, and. Uh, and so we want to get into that a little bit. And, and this feeds into, it's going to feed into a town hall next Thursday night. So I've got some details about that. Uh, let me start off, though, um, with, uh, it's over here. So the social distancing behavior, this is, um, this is what we're getting from the city of San Antonio. And, you know, and I'm not throwing any water on this, but... Uh, yes, uh, I'm seeing this quite a bit in my community, in my neighborhood, on Sunday afternoons. There's a lot of what you see, what we want to do, uh, and there's the, what we need to do. And I think probably it's quite more significant uh, And in terms of staying safe is the distance should be quite a bit uh, wider. And there's something just like minutes before like we came on uh, uh, this broadcast. This is a Dutch study. Um, and what we're understanding, if you look at the case up in the northwest, the choir got together. They weren't touching. They were singing. Uh, it's not so much the, the moisture, but, I mean, this virus will float on the air. And so this six-feet thing we're hearing is uh, really a minimum, in my opinion, uh, that we should be uh, not playing around with this. Uh, I do uh, try to post up resources around this as well. Um, the screening uh, has gotten a, a bit looser for folks. I know testing was really hard and almost impossible to come by before without a doctor's recommendation or if you weren't an emergency responder. Um, and, and so now there's a, there's a link here at the top, uh, this COVID-19 test. Go through that, and if it's determined through your answers that you're at high risk of infection, supposedly you'll be directed to a phone number to call, and, and then from there uh, to, gosh, where are they doing this? Um, at uh, 
Ooh, uh, to where uh, Freeman, yeah, Freeman Coliseum, where they're where they're actually doing this work. So uh, check that out um, and the opportunities there. Questions around COVID, questions uh, around uh, all these issues about uh, how to stay safe, how to identify uh, high risk. Uh, uh, check in. There's a phone number here. There's a, a an email and a website that is doing a pretty good job of, of staying and keeping the updates coming. Uh, Meals on Wheels continues to look for volunteers. Uh, as well as uh, if you are elderly, if you are uh, mobility impaired, uh, I think they're doing around 5,000 meals uh, a day or serving 5,000 households. Uh, but I really don't know the status of that. I've been reading about the, um, the food bank and, and the dire conditions there, the huge surge of folks uh, in need of food assistance uh, and the call out for the, uh, whether it was the Texas Guard or the National Guard to, to to help bring in food. So this is really critical. If you're able to share, uh, look for ways to do this. The link on the school meals uh, down here, uh, this is one I, I shared in the past, um, and uh, and it may be, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's happening with the district. So if you've got kids uh, in grade school and up to high school that are reliant upon um, uh, the breakfast and the lunch from the schools, uh, I definitely, uh, folks, check out that link and let me know if it's if 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 it's working and what you're hearing from the districts. So I'd love to share that. Uh, and always, you know, the the blood bank uh, looking for folks to uh, to donate there. And they also they, they say they're practicing social distancing, um, uh, and, and as well as they're going to do uh, an early screen uh, for you. So um, that may give some peace of mind, even though we know that the majority of folks are uh, that are contagious. Uh, may demonstrate no symptoms at all. So this is a really critical uh, issue. I um, want to put on my, I heard a comment, but I don't have it open uh, yet. Um, window, comments and reactions. Somebody, great work. Thank you. Hey, Mark Anthony, you were on the last one. So, hey, thanks for joining us. I think you're up in New York. Um, and I'm sure you've got similar things going on up there. Uh, I'm definitely, I'm not coming in as some kind of medical or even a policy expert. I'm trying to uh, stay up on the news. Um, and let's see, beyond the, the resources, I wanted to share something. Now, these are the folks that are keeping me afloat right now. Um, uh, I, I, you know, the CR Club. Uh, um, no, that's not the one I want. Um, here we go. Uh, have recently delivered this letter along with um, Didi with Public Citizen. So that organization and several others we'll get to uh, are calling on the governor uh, Abbott to declare an exe executive order that's uh, city. Uh, I mean, that, sorry, that statewide uh, here in San Antonio. Like I said, we we uh, our utilities have a moratorium on cutoffs. This does not extend to all the utilities around the state. The Public Utility Commission did something similar, uh, but still, you'll see here there's 72 city electric utilities and 67 co-ops that are not bound by that order. Uh, and so we're calling uh, for a statewide uh, for a statewide order. Uh, others have done it. You can see here Connecticut, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is critical, obviously, for folks uh, to be able to stay home. Not only the food uh, is critical, which is beginning difficult in San Antonio or, or may soon become more difficult. Um, but also just refrigerating those items and, and keeping cool and having good water and cooking all the rest. So if we're going to do not social distancing, again, this like <laughs> physical distancing, thank you guys, um, uh, we need to get this. So anyway, here's some of the organizations advancing this, Public Citizen, uh, Sierra Club, Texas Legal Services, Rio Grande Legal Aid, uh, and, and all these folks just scrolling through Texas Appleseed Disability Rights, Texas. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so thanks to those groups. If you all feel so moved, we try to do kind of an action element with each of these broadcasts, uh, and you'll probably see a few on this one. Uh, this is to call out Greg Abbott and, and kind of uh, add some weight, add some pressure. You can call, make this call. This is a general phone line to reach his office. Or if you want to make your call public, uh, here's uh, 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 Governor Abbott's Facebook and Twitter. And I'm sure they would love to. They would love to see a deluge of folks calling for a moratorium here. Uh, and I should say that this broadcast is leading into, and we're going to bring in Didi in a moment. Um, uh, a um, there it goes. I've been having trouble with this camera, so let me boost this one. Uh, close that one. Okay. Um, 
a uh, uh, a town hall that's going to be uh, where should I put this uh, next Thursday night. So here's a here's a link, uh, the time, the date where we're going to be talking about our utilities. We're going to be talk talking about uh, that we need more than just this moratorium. We need to be thinking about uh, folks who are going to be in really significant. Uh, significantly dire economic situations, uh, even when the peak, the crest of this, uh, the, the hump is passed. Um, and, and, and so this is really, uh, this is something that Didi's working on with me uh, and, and those on this broadcast, Meredith, and hopefully Bill as well. So let me see if I can bring uh, Didi on. Are you with me? I am. Hey, fantastic, fantastic. Well, let me ask you first of all, how you are doing, uh, if you're safe, and if there's anything that you need that, that folks may be able to help you with. I thank you for asking. I'm, I'm doing good. Um, uh, I'm here with my son, uh, 17, and and my partner. Uh, we're doing good. We're, we're staying safe. We're healthy. Um, I would say the only thing I need is for people to stay home. Um, stay home. If you don't need to be out and about, please, please don't. Yeah. Um, it'll keep uh, all of us safer and um, hopefully come out of this um, stay at home shutdown um, get out of that sooner mm -hmm. than uh, than later yeah thank you thank you very much and it's good to it's good to see you we've be sharing some text but I, it's really it's, it's nice to see that you're doing well uh, in these in the situation do you want to introduce yourself real quickly and then and then we can talk about uh, your work around the utilities uh, and and this idea of a just transition getting to uh, to, to, to real um, you know solid work that's going to protect working folks in San Antonio mm -hmm. sure um, I am a climate justice uh, organizer with public citizen we're a a consumer advocacy organization and uh, here in San Antonio, here in Texas, uh, we work on environmental issues and, and specifically here in San Antonio, um, working with the community, with uh, grassroots organizations and the city and CPS Energy to shut um, its uh, coal power plants, um, hopefully by 2025. And more recently, um, CPS Energy, the city have been talking about uh, forming a rate advisory committee mm -hmm. uh, for our utility. So that is uh, definitely working into uh, coming into play into our, our work um, along with the spruce shutdown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I wanted to kind of just comment on that in terms of the rate advisory uh, committee. So one of the things, the conversations I've been having with folks the the I think it was this week the San Antonio Water System just kind of put their rate advisory committee on ice, uh, even as the the Vista Ridge pipeline three billion dollar Vista Ridge pipeline is coming online, and 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 we're all going to be eating the bill you know eating that in our bills uh, when we when we don't need it. I'm going to make a comment uh, about that in, in a second. Um, uh, but but there was this rate advisory uh, work we're trying to get that done at CPS, and obviously where we're at right now. Um, uh, that's on hold. Uh, that hasn't been advancing the way we were hoping. Uh, and even the climate action plan, uh, uh, the climate action, these two committees they were going to be forming to put into work the, the climate action plan for the city of San Antonio. All of these, all of these, all these volunteers and community members could be working towards this, this, this uh, uh, planning for what happens after, right? And 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 that's a conversation I feel like. City leaders, elected leaders are scrambling to keep up with what's happening right now, but we can't just drift on this because what happens with when all this the utility bills and 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 rent and everything else comes due because it's this isn't a debt forgiveness program and, and the landlords will come knocking still and and they're putting up you know eviction notices even though they can't enforce them right now. So, um, uh, what are your thoughts on where we are right now in that regard? Well, actually, let me let me play this. I wonder if I can grab this real quick. This is Paula Gold Williams um, speaking recently um, on the the pause on the on the on the disconnects. There was a suggestion from Councilman Trevino about really looking at the ability for us to suspend disconnects. Um, we got on that immediately that day. Um, Mayor Nuremberg also reinforced that, that for us to, to look at enacting the ability to suspend uh, disconnects, and we did it. That's not unusual. We typically suspend disconnects over the, the hottest part of the summer and around the Christmas holidays. So we had a process and protocol, and we absolutely believe this is a thing that we need to do right now. 
we know that people are home. Um, we know that there are quite a few people that if you're not working, you're not making money. And so we understand that this is a period of time that what you don't need is to feel stressed about disconnecting. Okay, so uh, reaction. Certainly, we um, we we appreciate the utilities discontinuing, the, <clears throat> excuse me, disconnections uh, during this crisis. And as uh, Paula Go Williams mentioned, uh, which I didn't know for a long time, that they they don't disconnect during like the the hard, the hottest part of our of the months. <clears throat> and like I said, well, I appreciate that. Uh, we have to think uh, beyond this, uh, beyond the pandemic, uh, because what we're doing now, like washing our hands, uh, keeping our washing our hands uh, multiple times, is going to have to continue after uh, we're all able to go out and, out and about. So it's so important that people have continue to have running utilities that they have water to wash their hands, that they have hot water, warm water to uh, wash their hands, so they need electricity for that. So. Um, uh, it, it was understandable that the city, as they were trying to work through like online uh, meetings and communication uh, through this pandemic, that um, we still have to continue the conversations about about utilities and what's going to happen to um, all of our community that are, you know are most vulnerable, our working class families, all of those people that are unemployed, underemployed, like when they get back to when they get back to work, they're still going to be struggling, like you mentioned, with rent, with car payments. Uh, Paula Go Williams mentioned in that video that they would take every customer's case by case, that, you know, if you had um, past due fees, that they would uh, look at your case and, and waive uh, the fees. That's a lot of people that we're talking about. We're not just talking about a few hundred or a few thousand. We're talking about literally thousands and thousands of people here in San Antonio. So they need to, um, they need to, they need to, uh, be working with us and, and, and talking about this rate advisor committee and how we're going to help our community members get um, recover after mm -hmm. after all of this. Mm -hmm. So um, it's so important to be talking about um, the rate advisor committee now, how we're going to put that together so the most impacted mm -hmm. members of our community uh, will have a say yeah. in, in whether or not they're going to get out of debt sooner or stay in debt indefinitely because that could be a reality for many families here in San Antonio. Yeah, and we definitely know uh, some families, uh, some communities are at a much higher risk than others and that's becoming clear. I've been reading news stories around the country on that, but I just wanna thank you. Thank you for helping us put this program together for this coming week. Uh, and I wanted to uh, roll uh, over with this interview with Bill Barker. Uh, on, on some policy recommendations because the other thing that's happening is we're looking at the COVID uh, crisis, um, but what we're not doing is like, like we've been saying and like you were saying, talking about these other colliding crises. We're still in the midst and, and will be in a gathering climate crisis and why the, you know, getting the coal plant shut down is so important. Uh, but uh, heat island. So uh, if this if this had peaked in the middle of the summer, uh, this oh my I can't even imagine. So uh, anyway, Bill comes in with a couple of recommendations. Thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, I look forward to talking with you more and, and getting onto this panel. Uh, and um, uh, thanks for joining us uh, just for this brief conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, talk with you soon. And and, and like I was saying, so 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 here's. Uh, Bill Barker, our conversation on looking at ways that we can be addressing uh, Heat Island uh, and coming um, sooner than we would like. It should be pretty clear to people that we would be in a better place with regard to this COVID-19 virus if better planning had been done and, and uh, recommendations implemented as a result of that. I was just listening to what the country of Iceland has been doing and they've been virtually testing everyone, mm -hmm. identifying who's carrying the virus and uh, quarantining them, even though they may not show any symptoms. And they're doing so much testing that they're actually determining the different strains of the virus uh, uh, with DNA sequencing. And we like to ignore problems, it's unfortunately, is, is uh, what we see. We, we kind of wish they'd go away and we don't want to deal with them because you have to think hard and you have to change things and, and nobody likes change particularly. We see the same thing coming with uh, climate change where we know it's coming 
uh, we know the consequences. We know for the Dallas, uh, I'm sorry, for the San Antonio area. But we're talking about drought and heat as being our primary challenges here. Uh, and at the same time, our tree cover is is uh, is lessening, which which would help us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a pretty good program in trying to uh, conserve land to protect the uh, aquifer recharge areas, which will protect not only protect them and, and help us to have as much water as possible, but also it helps to cool the area. Uh, what we see from a science standpoint is we've got the global warming occurring, which is going to make us all warmer. But also, uh, we have a heat island effect. Uh, we've known since the 1800s that the cities were warmer than the surrounding countryside. And that's largely due to the absorption of heat by buildings, on surfaces like parking lots. But it's also due to human activity like uh, running uh, fossil fuel burning cars, uh, the output from air conditioners, uh, and things like that that just heat up mm-hmm. the city. Yeah, I've got a, 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 a graphic I'll, I'll share here. Oh. I'll pop it up on top of this uh, uh, for, for viewers um, where I think what's interesting is what we did with the, the climate action planning process is overlay these these levels of vulnerability you know that, that people experience and you'll see okay we'll map out I think the CDC did a lot of this years ago uh, nationally county to county um, what's the income you know of, of an area and disparities and in income disparities where is the elder population where are the young young uh, folks um, you know all, all of this and then you lay that on top of it what you were describing tree canopy um, the built environment and all this and you can definitely see for San Antonio there are hot spots you know we've been talking about them here for a while uh, and, it, and it's you know where you would kind of expect south side west side east side um, and, and some up in the northeast um, some really uh, where, where you see not only stressed and vulnerable people but people b- where that stress uh, and, and threat is compounded because of the, the policy decisions that, that we've made in terms of tree canopy and, and the rest. Um, and, and so this is one, a natural, quote unquote, natural phenomenon of cities, the way the, the weather and climate interact with cities, but something that, that we, is within our power to correct. And so um, I guess, you know, speaking about heat islands uh, in this way, kind of like this is a decision that's been made, right? Uh, well, yeah, and, and you're absolutely right, is, uh, you, you know, when you watch the weather on the news at night, uh, they're telling you the temperature at the airport. Well, the, the temperature varies considerably around uh, the city, uh, both daytime and nighttime. There are differences uh, with uh, global warming. They tell us, in particular, the nighttime temperatures uh, will probably be more noticeably warmer than the daytime temperatures. And that has its own set of effects. It's hard for the Earth to cool down overnight mm-hmm. uh, as a result of that. But but I've advocated that uh, we do what some other cities have done, uh, not so much in the U.S., but uh, the places put out instrumentation all around. They could be on bus shelters. They, that's to put them on uh, uh, municipal vehicles and uh, that the the, the the internet connection um, you're freezing up quite a bit, Bill. Unfortunately, oh. um, so I just want to kind of like repeat what I think you're describing is that we need to have not just relying on the airport, uh, San Antonio International Airport temperature readings, but having these across the city so we have a better understanding of how heat, heat island functions. Is that correct? Um, and I think the context, yeah. too, is, is why we're talking about this now is that um, my expectation, I think that of a lot of other people, is that the coronavirus, um, the COVID-19, that this pandemic, this doesn't end in no matter how long shelter in place lasts, whether Trump calls everybody out to, to be a patriot and go eat at Applebee's or not in a week um, is, is irrelevant because this is going to go on for a while. This is kind of like the next, you know easily year uh, you know of our lives the co- economic impact for much longer than that um the seasonal uh, revisiting uh, of this of these various strains it sounds like there's different strains um uh of this uh but we're going into summer 
and 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 like we talked about before summer here turns on in a heartbeat uh and and if we know that one people with less resources are less able to you know you don't have health care it's harder to stay away from you the pressure to go to work supporting you know families multiple you know multiple earners um uh on top of you know the heat stress and everything else this is something that we can't go to sleep on we can you know it's great that our leaders are are, are drilling into you know the coronavirus uh, this pandemic threat uh, but we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and and do some real visionary work uh in, around this uh heat island area is that kind of you want to kind of jump in from there sure no uh you're right i mean we we need to keep Pressing, uh, pressing ahead with what we're doing, and and put public health as a as a primary reason of why we're doing things. I think uh, I noticed the Urban Land Institute as a they their new initiative is uh, healthy places, um, and we need to be thinking about that. What how do we make San Antonio a healthier place than it is right now? Um, and uh, as you point out, there's some inequities uh, in our cities as people are health and public health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I mean, what would you what would you like to see moving forward? Obviously, we're identifying a problem. Uh, there are um, some policy responses that could be put into place. Um, how much is this contingent upon federal support? How much is contingent upon, therefore, uh, political uprising um, and turning over of Congress? I mean, what what is your call to action for folks to be able to uh, take this on? It's it's a it's a big challenge. I think uh, uh, some things that, if I were king, I'd, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd be tempted to do. Uh, one is to pursue this idea of getting instrumentation out and around throughout the city so that we have a better idea where uh, temperatures are uh, really challenging for people. And by the way, you need to do more than just temperature. You need to get humidity and wind speed and mm -hmm. wire the uh, technology for uh, pollution detection is, is uh, get, get to the point where you get a chip mm -hmm. that will measure uh, Articulates. Wow! Say. Yeah, uh, it's really impressive, uh, and uh, s s I think eventually someday we won't have these rare ozone monitors around. You know, two whatever what are the three of them, four of them around mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. They're actually be all over, so we have a better understanding of exactly where these concentrations are. Um, so that would be one thing. Better under to start getting the data as to what the problem is in that regard. Another thing is, uh, I admired the way uh, Mayor Castro years ago uh, uh, was able to use CPS Energy as a leverage in order to bring technology development here into the city with LED street lights and uh, solar panels and the like. Uh, I think that the a huge uh, technology area is uh, in air conditioning, developing uh, new strategies for air conditioning, uh, like using absorptive technologies, which actually translate heat into cooling, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in a magic sort of physics way. Uh, and uh, we not we not only need that here, of course, uh, but think about the global market for this. I know we're talking about global warming. There's an incredible demand for uh, air conditioning technology, particularly that would be uh, very efficient and inexpensive and so on. And uh, uh, it would be, uh, I think it would be really cool to have San Antonio be a hub for that kind of technology development and deployment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yo, Castro. We are Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say. I mean, uh, there there was that. I remember, I remember that there was that moment where Castro they rolled out the OCI, uh, uh, the solar you know deal, 
um, here and there was you know three or four other companies that that came in and it had to do with you know LED lights and this kind of thing where they were incentivizing and actively reaching out to uh, what they were considering at the time kind of like the uh, renewable and sustainable types of companies we wanted to become a hub for that kind of work and and you're right I haven't seen that and I don't know if the Economic Development Foundation or the city or county or who uh, has even continued to carry that um, we talk a lot about CPS and I've organized and done a lot around um, the utilities, um, but not that. That seems to have gone dormant. Would you say? Uh, well, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't. I, I tend to hear more about cybersecurity, yeah. which of course is an important technology, and uh, uh, we seem to be uh, putting uh, an effort into developing that capacity here locally. And there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, uh, I'd like to see us, as we're talking about these other issues, I'd like to see us continue to uh, advance some technologies related to renewable energy and sustainability mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, let's see. Uh, one of the things, uh, Councilman Trevino has spearheaded a cool roof program, which I think is a great idea. The city was already helping uh, low-income folks who couldn't do it on their own to uh, get a new roof that wouldn't leak. But in the process, they got a cool roof, which, which kept them cooler and warmer inside the house as need be uh, by using uh, more advanced technology. And that's, that's a great example of, we were doing it already, but we just are now doing it uh, more sparkly and getting some payback. Uh, in, well, or vegetative roofs. You know, some cities are commercial buildings that have vegetative roofs. Um, uh, but uh, the other thing that I think about a lot is these big uh, parking lots that the city uh, you know, uh, traffic engineers have a rule book that they use to figure out how many parking spaces a, a establishment will need. And uh, it's been shown in urban areas that these are these uh, requirements are excessive. We end up with, with too much paved parking, mm -hmm. uh, and the problem everybody could uh, can quickly realize that that's a big source of heat during the summer. And there's actually a program, an initiative called DPAVE, where people identify excess asphalt parking spaces and convert them into, uh, say, natural grassland or something else that is cooler and will absorb the water uh, into the ground rather than have it run off someplace uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's another area that I think some more could be done to reduce um, either different materials or just the, in the case of parking lots, the, the sheer size mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the uh, the. Uh, impervious cover in order to help keep us cooler and it, and it has other benefits too it would be considered a low impact development approach to handling stormwater by doing that kind of thing as well mm -hmm. so I mean those are those are some uh, a couple key areas uh, anything else uh, that that is kind of top of mind for you just that uh, particularly uh, com comes up uh, in, in kind of the uh, following the news uh, at the moment or uh, anything you want to kind of like call people's attention to in terms of how they can begin to affect changes and for promoting uh, depaving uh, or the roofs program or, or some other area <coughs> virus issue has caused uh, economic stress so will heat and drought mm -hmm. to the San Antonio uh, we know that as the temperature goes up we'll see more health-related issues, including fatalities. <clears throat> Heat is the most dangerous weather phenomenon we have. We, 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 uh, more people die from heat than die from hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or anything else. And um, so it shouldn't be dismissed as, oh, it's just getting warmer uh, and just ignore it. Uh, it will have an impact on people's health. Uh, you need to start thinking about shifting work hours so that folks that have to be outdoors don't have to be out during the hottest time of the day. Uh, we will likely see uh, uh, 
some cut back in agricultural capability. We don't think of that so much in the city per se, but uh, like the Poteet Strawberry Festival, you don't have to go very far to realize that there is ag agricultural activity surrounding us, helping to feed us, and uh, uh, though agriculture will be stressed, again, by heat and drought. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Bill. I really appreciate you, and I always enjoy talking with you. Uh, I learn a lot uh, being around, uh, being when I'm, when I'm around you, so uh, I, I, I'm planning to do this again. Uh, I don't know if that's right. a threat or, or, or how you take that, <laughs> um, but... But we'll connect again, and uh, hopefully, uh, more in bringing more uh, bodies with us, more voices. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Talk again soon. So, um, yeah, Bill Barker. I, you know, I neglected to introduce him uh, at the top of this. Bill has uh, he's been he's been around uh, the wheel in policy circles, uh, working today as a consultant on some pretty interesting projects that we'll hope to tap into. But he was, uh, for a time, an executive director of Solar San Antonio, uh, working at the Office of Sustainability here in San Antonio, as well as doing uh, a variety of, um, uh, like, leading the MPO in Dallas. Um, just, just a really cool dude. Um, I want to, uh, well, I want to get my power plant back on, uh, see how this is going. There we go. Um, and uh, and so I do want to like introducing Meredith McGuire. She's uh, a, a professor emerita. I'm told that is the 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 gender neutral Latin version of emeritus. I'm gonna trust uh, my source on that. Um, but but she's done a tremendous amount of work on, on on the San Antonio water system as well as CPS. But particularly in analyzing the the bills and how the folks in San Antonio are charged uh, for uh, not really really their water use necessarily, but being tied into the water network. And so as Vista Ridge kicks on, uh, I believe April fifteenth. Uh, this is water that's five times more expensive than what we draw out of the Edwards that is beneath our feet. Uh, will likely be a, a, a fueling growth along the I-35 corridor long before it ever reaches San Antonio or we really demonstrate a need for that water. Uh, certainly an economic depression or recession is going to uh, pose a significant challenge on how we pay for it if we need it. Uh, our projection populations for San Antonio, we'll always hear about those million people coming here or, or, or uh, population growth here. Uh, so there's, there's some significant and serious issues that need to be dealt with at San Antonio Water System as well. Uh, and, and beyond just terminations, beyond just not turning off people's water is uh, how we expect people to pay for it. So there are increasing calls for us to terminate uh, bills for, for low-income folks entirely during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and if there's a concern, uh, my friend Terry at the Sierra Club wrote uh, in, a, in an email to the group, there's a concern over financial shortfalls. I know the city's dealing with uh, a lot of this right now, terminating all of its arts funding, which is uh, hurting a lot of friends of ours, friends and family. Uh, but if there's a concern about that, then we know those rates push them up the hill to those who can pay them and to the heaviest industrial uh, commercial users. So anyway, I do want to uh, to bring Meredith in. We had a great conversation. Uh, she's an incredible resource in San Antonio. And uh, without any more delay, Dr. Meredith McGuire. Dr. McGuire, would you introduce yourself uh, and maybe um, talk about um, where you found your place in kind of like utility justice landscape. Yes, I have to admit that when I retired from teaching at Trinity, I didn't quite imagine I was going to end up uh, so much tied up with the whole issue about utilities and their costs mm. and their rates and their policies and so forth. But in a lot of respects, it fits in with a lot of what I was teaching for many years. I was teaching courses about health and the environment, and utilities fit into both of those in different ways. And so uh, it was a, an easy step for me to take a look at what's happening in San Antonio and say, hey, this is simply not fair. This is very unjust the way the utilities are operating here. And it seems like they're not serving the people, the public, even though they're public utilities, they're serving some business interests that are not necessarily what we really want to have. So that's how I got 
cook to do this. I've been working as a volunteer, full-time volunteer with the Sierra Club locally. Uh, Sierra Club is increasingly involved in a whole lot of social justice issues, and that fits into what I care about uh, a lot, too. So that's how I got involved. Uh, and I would say that I've been working on uh, SAWS rate issues for about six years now. Uh, and I've also been doing a lot of work about their uh, pol water policies and uh, as an environmentalist, but also as a sociologist. I think there's a lot of uh, important policy making that they have just been, um, I would say they've trashed San Antonio's water supply um, uh, planning and so forth. So wow. uh, I think that we can, we can, save some of it because there's some good people here who are trying really hard to make sure that we're prepared for future uh, mm -hmm. drops and other uh, other issues, especially around um, the fact that climate change is going to make things so much worse with regard to mm -hmm. water. So, yeah, yeah, well, that the language is a strong language, trashing our, our, our water supply or um, when I consider the way sauce presents itself as we've gone down, the per capita consumption has gone down this far and we use this less and we diversify our sources. Is that about sourcing or is that about use? Or are you talking about, or maybe you, if you could also describe what's wrong with their, with their rate structure and who's bearing the cost of their water infrastructure development? So real quickie about supply and demand. I'm not an economist, although I've had to learn a lot about economics in, in this process. But one of the biggest problems that SAWS has is that it made some very uh, big mistakes regarding how much future demand there was going to be. And so supply and demand, which is what the economists are always talking about, uh, are, are things that uh, utilities have to look ahead uh, about. But if they're making really big decisions for a long-term future and they've made the, all the wrong assumptions about how much demand there's going to be in the future, then the end result is that they could put huge amounts of money and investment into a project that is perhaps uh, what they call a stranded asset even by the time it's built. Mm -hmm. um, so. And I think this is also true of CPS. So if you want to come back to that topic later with CPS, it fits to some of their problems too. So what happened then in San Antonio was uh, about 2013 or 2014, we were in the midst of a very bad drought. Uh, I forget exactly which year it was that they had both staged three and four drought restrictions. That meant that a lot of companies couldn't use as much water as they wanted to. Uh, the aquifer was going down very, very fast. And, and so uh, there was a notion that, oh my gosh, we have to have a more reliable water supply so that we can use all the water that these businesses want to use, mm -hmm. even though there's a drought going on. Mm -hmm. And that's the stage at which they then started making these very foolish mistakes about projecting the current usage, actually they were using the 2010-2011 uh, water, per capita water usage figures to try to project how much more water they were going to need down mm. the future. And So they're like, we need a giant straw to sick into somebody's teacup on the other side of the state somewhere. Exactly. Right? Okay. Because... Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing that happened was that the SAW's um, own staff recommended against the pipeline project. The idea this is the Vista Ridge. Now it's called the Vista Ridge project. Okay. At that, that stage in the game, they had just put out a tentative set of uh, inquiries about who wants to offer uh, a deal for X amount of water. Mm -hmm. And that X amount of water was considerably less than the local businesses were saying, no, we've got to have more than that. We've got, mm -hmm. if we want it for the city to grow, we have to have a lot more water than that. And that was sort of where the birth of the Vista Ridge project came mm -hmm. about. But, mm -hmm. but you're right that if, if you were to take uh, the uh, amount of water used per person, say 40 years ago, and project uh, a project that won't be uh, finished paying for it until, say, 40 years ahead of now, and you decided to 
build some project that was so big that it would take care of those kinds of water usages per person. And then you're saying, oh, and we might have another million and a half people living here, so we have to add, we have to provide enough for them to have that much water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the reality is, and, and I've got some graphs I can show you if you want to plug that in at this point in the that interview. That sounds dangerous. Okay. <laughs> I've got uh, graphs. If you had put, if you had taken the figures that were put in, uh, and then you projected them wrong, and you and you didn't take for the allowance that people would cut right. back on how much water they used voluntarily, that they would become using more water efficient appliances, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things that have significantly been reduced in the last 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you end up with a project that has far more water than you need mm -hmm. and you're stuck having to pay for it mm -hmm. and guess what the Vista Ridge project has to be paid for starting next week $220,000 a day next week San Antonio so is obliged to what's the total price that's a billion to I mean what's the total price tag and $220,000 a day we're going to be paying Yes, two hundred twenty thousand okay. dollars a day. I don't have the exact figures in front of me, and mm -hmm. I had made the mistake of using the wrong figures. Uh, so yeah. let me just say it's it's two hundred twenty thousand billion dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, this is a good point to 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 to, to bring in uh, our good spot to bring in two thoughts. One is uh, right now in San Antonio, due to the uh, the novel coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, uh, both SAWS and CPS, city-owned utilities, our utilities, the utilities we own, uh, have announced they're going to have a, like a freeze on uh, 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 cut cutoffs, right? So they're not going to cut off someone's water, someone's power uh, for non-payment. Um, We'll see how long that lasts, and we'll see how long when when they feel like it's you know we can all go back to work and 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 be punished in the way that that they're they're used to uh, doing uh, for non-payment. Um, but we're also moving into summer uh, pretty soon. It's going to get warmer, uh, and we're moving into a really bleak economy uh, where uh, not only have we you've you painted this picture, we made or saws rather in this case, uh, CPS, I would argue, and maybe some other ways, made these big, you know, billion dollar plus decisions, energy and water decisions uh, that have put us on the hook, you know, for to repay for decades. Um, we've got this uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, uh, crisis, uh, a, a marginal response, and, and, and yet we still have to pay off these huge, inter you know, uh, loans. Um, how is that being done? And can you describe, I mean, that's a lot, but describe the rate structure and how SAWS is, is plans to move this forward? Well, um, first of all, I learned this morning that um, at the SAWS board meeting that uh, SAWS believes it has enough in reserves to make it through to the end of this fiscal year without too much problem. Uh, but we may actually be economically reduced for many, many, many more months. Uh, a lot of the businesses that have uh, laid people off may not get started up again, or they may be, um, you know, trying to figure out whether they want to consolidate some of their operations and drop a, a few people and so forth. But it's entirely likely that the um, the sequestration, the uh, or, uh, what, what's the term they're using, but the the notion of, of quarantining people so that they won't spread the mm -hmm. COVID nineteen uh, um, worse, that alone is likely to last for several more months. Uh, right. I hope it right. doesn't, because a lot of us are going to go stir crazy in the meantime. Uh, but the reality is that that is our best protection right now. And uh, the longer we can keep it really carefully, um, you know, uh, protected, the better off we're going to be. So the issue then is double, full, double because, uh, yes, SAWS has enough money with its reserves. But because the way the rates are structured and because they are not going to start up the rate structuring 
change the committee that could change the rate structure, then this really means that this is going to come out of the hides of the residential rate payers. Because in 2015, the rate structure was changed in a way that actually put a heaviest burden for this Vista Ridge water, not on the businesses that are, that are going to profit from it, not on the, um, not especially even on the people who are wasting water on their lawns and, and so forth, but it is the ordinary rate payers who, and the reason for that is that the rate structure has two parts. Uh, one part of it is fixed charges, and that's what's hurting the um, the residential rate payers because the fixed charges in San Antonio are the highest in the state. Okay. So when you get your water bill, there's a bunch of prices on there, and some of the prices are the same price that you pay every month just for access to the water, just for the um, sewage uh, removal and so forth, you have to pay those fees and, and, um, they, those fees go up in time. They've gone up 88% between 2009 and 2019. So that's a huge increase in those fixed rates. And of course, people who are on fairly low incomes are already struggling back in 2009, but by 2019, uh, their wages weren't going up anywhere near as fast. As Picture you've gotten your, uh, your saws bill and it'll have uh, a couple of figures that don't vary much. Uh, sometimes they go up a little bit, but for the large part, the, you have to pay that fixed charge no matter how much water you use. Uh, you know, just it's your access to water and sewage service in the city of San Antonio. And uh, then there's another set of charges that are based upon how much water you use and, and how much um, sewage, which of course is based on the water you use, but it's based upon your winter usage. So those figures vary, but usually the price per unit is pretty slow, pretty low. So a lot of people don't pay much attention to it. Um, so, the fixed rates are the things that hurt the residential rate payers the worst because uh, in San Antonio, they've got the fixed rates have gone up so much that right now, uh, well, right now, I think this is maybe 2019 figures that I'm using here rather than 2020. But um, uh, San Antonio's fixed rates for water and sewer came to $27.61 each month. And you compare that then with Austin, which is the next highest fixed rates in the state, they're paying only $17.55. And in Dallas, the rate payers uh, are paying only $10.11. And in Houston, they're paying zero dollars and zero cents per month for the fixed charges. So, uh, and all of these are acceptable, I say, uh, to the uh, Public Utility Commission as all of those are considered to be fair rates. Uh, so different cities have different ways of arranging their rates, but at SAWS, the fixed charges for the residential rates have gone up much more dramatically. As a matter of fact, the sad thing that happened in 2015 was that the base rates for the water part that's based upon the number of gallons you use each month, uh, and those rates actually were reduced. The main one that's relevant to the Vista Ridge project is what's called the water supply fee. Uh, the water supply fee was only created about a little bit less than 20 years ago. And it was created because we were trying to diversify our water supplies. And so a lot of those projects involved uh, extra expenses. And so what they did was they set up this uh, water supply fee, which initially was the same amount for the same amount of water for all users, the the uh, residential rate 
taxpayers, the um, businesses, but every category initially paid the same water supply fee. Mm -hmm. And then they started creating different kinds of tiered rates so that the residential users have tiers that are based upon, you know, how much water you use. And those tiered rates do go up, but it's interesting that they've changed over the years. So between 20... 15 and 2016, they changed the tiers there that actually reduced the prices of the water supply fee for the businesses, or uh, excuse me, for the um, the residents who used the most water. Wow. So, person who was, and the way they did that was they had these tiered rates. It looked like they were really steep, but in 2015, they changed the rate such that the um, the houses that were using the most water on their lawns and so forth actually got a rate reduction because it eliminated the seasonal rates mm. that had previously been what was the basis for what those those houses were supposed to pay. Mm -hmm. But then it also reduced the rates um, for the um, businesses before mm. twenty before twenty sixteen. Uh, the businesses had to pay. Uh, the same original flat charge that was put up there. And then in 2016, the, the rates were then changed such that the industries that were using lots and lots and lots of water mm -hmm. actually made money uh, in that process mm -hmm. because it reduced their lowest fee lowest price to the uh, something pegged to the second tier of the residential mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they made the tiers there different for example yeah. Yeah. in the residential rate pairs if, if you use you know a million gallons you pay a whole bunch of that at the highest rate but on the uh, businesses it's different now mm -hmm. because their lowest rate is only for it's for the businesses that use no more than they no more water than they used the previous year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and so that means that 85 percent, approximately 85 percent, of all of those businesses that were using so much water qualified for that very lowest rate yeah, for yeah. almost all of their yeah. water. Yeah. And it wasn't until the third tier where they had to pay more. But even then, that was a deal for them because the following year, if they doubled the amount of water mm -hmm. they used, that one year they'd have to pay a little bit more for the second half of that mm -hmm. amount. But the next year, yeah. they got the whole thing at the very lowest rate again. So some of this will be able to share visually. I mean, I've seen you present mm -hmm. before, and, and you've got a couple slides that speak to this. And so we should be able to pop that up here. Um, and I'm going to repeat myself a little bit because I had, I think my mic was muted before, but just, just anecdotally, you know, we talked about who's bearing the, the, the cost of, of, yeah. of the SAW's operations, uh, where, where the, where the, where the burden falls the hardest. And, and the bulk of that is on the working families of San Antonio. Your, your research demonstrates, and I know for myself, uh, you know, a typical, uh, 35, $40, 35 to 45 more recently, because of some rate increases, I think, uh, dollar bill, uh, just a small, small part of that is actually the water that I'm using, and so there's, there's very, there's, there's, there's really not a way for me to get out of this relationship I have with, with the utility as long as I have a connection to the, the, the network. Um, but I think it's interesting, and, and just to pivot here a little bit, you, you, you said you were that today the, 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 the board at the San Antonio Water System, SAWS uh, Board of Trustees, uh, did a couple of things, and one was they, they put the ratepayer uh, advisory committee. Uh, on ice, uh -huh. uh, and then gave the CEO uh, Puente uh, a, a kind of dictatorial powers to make decisions going forward outside of a transparent and democratic process. Um, we're moving in, deepening, and I've you know mentioned in this last broadcast, you know, around the world, there's a serious lurch to authoritarian structures, you know, that were already in the works. A lot of them. But because of Corona, right, the coronavirus, uh, novel coronavirus pandemic, um, here we're walking into, and I kind of want to shift to start looking ahead, because I think you had an idea that it really captured my imagination is, 
okay, this, but then what? Um, you know, where, okay, we, we've got this, you know, momentary pause on dis disrupted service. It's not, has nothing to do with the, the, the inequity of the rates and the rate burden uh, of, of keeping San Antonio water system afloat or making money to, to fund other city services. Um, but we're kind of in a, in a lurch, right, where, where a lot of the, the more progressive uh, work happening in the city, uh, marginally progressive, the SAW's you know, rate advisory com committee process, there was a rate advisory committee being formed at the mayor's direction and, and adopted by the, the board of trustees at CPS Energy. That may be going nowhere. It certainly didn't appear on their last agenda. Uh, we've got, you know, after a couple of years of work, the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. Uh, we've been expecting, you know, those boards to come together and start making decisions. Um, we're going to come out, as we've talked about, we're going to come out at some point of the worst of this. You know, we go through our curve or whatever that looks like with a lot of people who will die, um, but also a lot of other people that would be financially just broken uh, in a city that's already, you know, you, you pointed out in the past, half, uh, half of the, the working families, uh, wage earners, you know, uh, considered low income, uh, a poor city, a working city. Um, uh, and, and so if we're not planning, if these rate committees aren't meeting and planning, if the, uh, climate action plan isn't meeting and planning, we're going to come into, uh, a, a, a situation where, where we have, we're not, we have no response for it other than, are we going to charge you or not? Are we going to evict you or not? Um, so this idea, I think it, it, it's, 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 is an excellent one is to maybe, uh, just, do we need to create a new body? Uh, and what would be your proposal? I mean, I feel like if, if we could get the mayor or somebody to appoint like a utility, you know, future, uh, utilities, future, power and water, democracy, power and water, something to come back with that when we're at the intersection of COVID-19, you know, extreme uh, summer temperatures, possibly drought, financial, you know, fiscal burdens, you know, somebody has to dream solutions yeah. here. So I don't know. What would you? How would you speak to that? Well, uh, I'm I'm glad you raised this. I'm 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 trying to figure out how to answer two questions at the same time. And so let me just do it as quickly as I can. But I think that number one, that we already have some things going on here that are very hopeful. Uh, it's very frustrating because we're all unable to go sit in the same room and start talking to people around these things, but I do know that um, uh, Ron Nuremberg and the City Council are really working already on trying to figure out ways by which this can be negotiated, and I hope that they will find ways of listening to the kinds of things that we have to offer to. Um, for example, they're talking about what could be done to um, help people with rates in the meantime. Um, I am um, I have a an op-ed piece that's going to appear in the uh, Wednesday uh, tomorrow's uh, Express News, and I've got some of those suggestions right there. Um, most of my suggestions are based upon things that. Uh, the what, uh, affordability expert, uh, Dr. Manny Teodoro uh, from A&M, has recommended, and he was um, one of the... Um, yeah, let's not skip the recommendations, because this is going to come out after the, the article, so people could okay. theoretically find it, but it, okay. it'd be nice to stand alone. If you're going to um, introduce okay. uh, the, the researcher, but also the... Yeah. Okay, let me start over again then. Okay, so... I think that we should be we should take advantage of some of the things that uh, our city council and the mayor are already talking about. I think that they are open to these kinds of things, and the city council does have the authority to speak to SOS rates issues. Uh, so, uh, although they want to tiptoe carefully around it because they don't want to end up uh, making those more democratic uh, processes um, look like they're being jettisoned at the same time, there's a lot that they can do right now. And I think that one of the things that we have to be worried about is a different kind of an epidemic. I am very fearful that we're going to have between now and September uh, an, epic of, an epidemic of despair. I think that um, yeah. many, many families, including middle-class yeah. families who 
who have a lot of, of uh, risks going on for them, but especially those low-income workers who don't see their jobs coming back or they're just sort of making ends meet by uh, little bits of, of pieces of stuff that they can do. I think we have to be very concerned about the despair that this is going to trigger and and have and people are already uh, at, acknowledging that we're going to be seeing greater and greater amounts of you know domestic violence and uh, issues about people um, you know being lost in depression or uh, or alcoholism and so forth and so we have to find ways to uh, keep our spirits up in the community to build resilience and not just resilience but mutually affirming kinds yeah. of activities that that give us the sense that we can do something even while we're feels like we're just waiting um, and I think that those are the kinds of things that uh, City Council I believe it was uh, Anna Sandoval who is going to be working on trying to figure out ways to uh, bolster the local economy. And we can be working on those kinds of things right now. Uh, but one of the things about that is to say to SAWS, I'm sorry, you can't just do that. You mm -hmm. can't just uh, hit everybody with a full bill of everything that they would have had to have paid if all of this disaster wasn't happening around them. Because none of the working class has the power to um, be able to even borrow enough money mm -hmm. to pay that bill. Um, but so I, I wanted to, to break away from that. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to catch the, the, the full the conversation on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, hold on, let me close this down. Um, just for time's sake, we, got a, we had a little uh, front end uh, uh, time sync there and, and some poor planning on my part. Uh, but I've got a couple of updates and, and, and that I wanted to share and then get our Poet Laureate for San Antonio, uh, Andrea Vocab Sanderson up here and give her the time uh, that, that she deserves. Um, but here you'll see a little note about broadband for all. Um, obviously something is happening across the city and, and hope maybe there, there may be a similar thing happening in San Antonio where there's an, an initiative uh, from folks here in San Antonio to, to see if we can't deliver um, uh, broadband across the city um, for all residents. Maybe it's a city network, a municipal network. Um, but anyway, this is a, a, an initiative. It's a national one. So uh, obviously this is a huge equity issue. So I'm recommending that. There was uh, something else that I ran across today that I want to flash up on here. Uh, Indigenous Environmental Network. They've got some grants out um, uh, for emergency mutual aid. Uh, I'm recommending folks go to this website. Uh, this is for my uh, tribal native friends and your communities. Uh, the this is a 2,000. These are micro kind of micro grants, $2,000 grants uh, for uh, this could be essential provisions, food, water, medication, diapers, cleaning supplies. It may be uh, transportation for essential needs and provisions, hospital visits, groceries, or, or it could be related to small business slowdowns and other cash flow difficulties. So check out ienearth.org. Um, and, 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 and these opportunities there. Uh, the other one was on our, I think our first broadcast, we talked about the South Texas Residential Center, formerly the Dilly Detention Center, uh, migrant detention camp, uh, and, and uh, 81 families being kept there. They're, uh, prob probably the suspicion is that they're involved in several federal lawsuits. Uh, there's a letter writing campaign uh, and there's a, I just got a report back like literally a few minutes ago that they've been getting hundreds of letters. They're particularly interested in letters from children. So if your kids are home from school uh, and they're doing, uh, you know, any kind of like art projects, think about doing some, some, some letters uh, to folks here. And I think this is TRLA, um, what's the address? Um, 1111 uh, North Main. Avenue. This is really seat of the pants stuff. Sorry about this. Um, oh, let me open that again. Sorry. Uh, and San Antonio, Texas, uh, 78212. 7, 8, 2, and 2. So anyway, uh, check these guys out. TRLA here. 
write them a letter, send letters to the kids, the families uh, being held at the South Texas Family Residential Center. Let them know that people care about them, that they're not alone. It's got to be a terrifying uh, period of time when we know detained families, detained peoples are most vulnerable uh, uh, to, uh, to the COVID-19 uh, 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 crisis here um, and and future episodes here I hope you all would check back and share this we really want to tackle domestic violence we've been talking with some folks to to raise awareness about domestic violence which is just you know really like uh, through the through the roof with all the stress and the strain uh, I it's um, it's out there and I'm sure folks are hearing and seeing uh, all that as well as you know Meredith uh, McGuire talks about the epidemic of despair so we want to go after uh, mental health uh, topics as well anything that folks here uh, care to recommend. We're certainly working with the, the arts community, musicians who have been on the show, uh, and poets uh, to bring your recommendations. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce Vocab, and thank you for joining us. Obviously, it's not very comfortable. I was really resisting the urge to, I didn't want to get online. I didn't want to start um, talking to people this way and doing shows this way. Uh, but I realized that um, people were requesting it and wanting it. And I, I want to, I did, I definitely took some time to just probably like a, a week and a half, two weeks to, to not really deal. And I mean, I talked to, you know, my close friends, I talked to them here and there, but really just kind of check out and, um, think about some things, pray about some things. Cause I feel like, you know, this could, this is a, a time to do some reflection. I feel like, and, and figure out what, what can we change what can we do different? Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. the time to, to kind of regroup and reset um, some things. Uh, so spiritually, I've been checking in a lot more, um, and just spending some time. I mean, I've always been a lot of one of those people that a lot of people think, oh, you're so extroverted. You know, you're always on stage. <laughs> I'm really not. Like when I come off stage, I go in my room and I mm -hmm. shut the door. I go in my room. It's like know? that's the job so, part of it, right? Right. I had yeah. to, I had to, I have to get alone with my thoughts and really process the world and I feel like some people this is scary for them because they have to be alone with themselves and I, I want I think that's something that I would like to speak to and and some of my upcoming writings is the idea of getting comfortable with ourselves because um, mm -hmm. a lot of people spend so much time focused on their image for the outward expression of how it appears to other people um, but you have to do the work in, internally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not to be preachy or anything like that, but it's just our, our reality. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm doing okay though. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really good. I'm really blessed. I was able mm -hmm. to keep my job, um, mm -hmm. I, the way I, where I work at, I mean, I work in a prison facility, so, or a detention facility, so that that's not going to close, you know, mm -hmm. population, mm -hmm. what it's weird is trying to figure out how to, um, conduct ourselves and, you know, because we, I think the whole world is like, okay, we have to quickly put some things into practice that we were not practicing and do things we were not doing yet. You know, so I, I, it was really weird for me to start wearing that mask, mm -hmm. um, but I, I knew that I needed to start wearing the mask to work. So, uh, starting to wear a mask to work, um, putting on gloves when I know that I need to be touching things and, right. um, not being able to touch people is probably the most jarring thing that I can't stand. I can't stand not being able to touch people. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, and I, I don't think I, even that I'm that much of a touchy feely person, mm -hmm. but there's certain people that I'm just like, and I'm like, Oh yeah. Can't. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. And it's like we're doing it to protect, not just ourselves, we're trying to protect other people. Have, and that's the thing that I think is mentally messing with a little bit. Um, other than yeah. that, you know, things pretty cool. Um, and just trying to find other ways to be, express my creativity um, so that it doesn't feel stifled or locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mm -hmm. think, you know, I'm trying to help other people. But, I mean, we're, going, we're in Na National Poetry Month, so it's like that's that's the job of the poet anyway this month is to, to show other people our poetry is so much for other people to to take in and, and share right. with them and not just keep to ourselves during this time. But, uh, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. just enjoy doing that, helping people mm -hmm. find their voice or get reacquainted with their voice yeah. Well, this is certainly a time, you know, poetry is, is such an art of uh, reflection as much as it is expression, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like when in crises like this, 
even if this wasn't happening outside and we were just stuck in our houses, right? I mean, like some of the, like the population you work with, right? Some of the people there, it creates reflection and it can be damaging, right? I mean, it can be too much for folks. Um, and so do you have uh, kind of like any recommendation for, for people who maybe not be handling this as well? I mean, is it is part of that writing or is it something else? Oh, definitely. Um, my my first go-to, and, and it's probably going to sound preachy, but I say first we need to pray, like tap into the source from which, from whence you know, we draw strength. Um, if, if it comes from outside of yourself, some people, they, they don't believe in higher power. They don't believe in God. You know, I believe in God. So I, I could not be making it through this whole situation without prayer, without, mm -hmm. um, talking to, to God about what's happening right now. And then, um, you know, find expressions that bring you joy. If there's a music or, or, or a book, find something that brings you joy that you can do in the space and, even if you have to do it remotely with someone, if there's somebody who has the same interest as you, you know, ask them, hey, will you read this book while I'm reading this book? Will you watch this show while I'm watching the show? Will you do this artistic expression? Like, I don't know, crafting or mm -hmm. I've been using Canva a lot because I've been making post digital posters for these poems for people. And I've never used Canva, but I'm like, hey, this is another cool form uh, for me to express myself. I mean, if you're in an adult coloring whatever like um and i know people have children so then there's the whole idea of inviting your children into the things that you do or figuring out what they're interested in and sharing that that experience together um mm -hmm. but like just kind of even in even in our isolated spaces if we can invite other people in to what we're experiencing mm -hmm. i think that's a good thing mm -hmm. and do you have uh i should ask do you have any needs yourself that folks in the community uh may be able to respond to uh, you know, no, just pray for me, man. <laughs> like, uh, um, I have show, I have a lot of shows this week. It's crazy. Um, I have three shows that are public and then I have something that's more private for like, um, kindergartners where I'm going to be speaking and I've never spoken to kindergartners. I'm like, what is this? Like, this uh -huh. is uncomfortable. Like I'm, I was like, I can do third grade and up as far as teaching is concerned. But like this week I'm doing, uh, this is my first time I'm going to be doing like teaching kindergartners and then I'm going to be doing it virtually. So I'm like, this is just weird. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I think it's just like, um, I'm one of those people that kind of fights change. I don't open it like change. Come here. Let me hug you. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those, like stay over there, change. Hold on. Let me get yeah. myself together. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so um, just, you know, people to be patient with me. You know, there's, we all got to be patient with each other. Yeah. Uh, and realize that's just well, what, what time it is right now. You know, patience. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, did you want to, to share a, a few poems with us? Mm -hmm. I can share a piece or two. Uh, let me see. I got my handy dandy book right here. Okay. <laughs> It just so happened to be sitting right beside me. Uh, I think I would like to, the, it's like, and, and also the idea of turning my bedroom into like an office space. <laughs> also very strange for me. I was like, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, Who, who's coming into my house now, right? Right. It's, it's so funny. So I'm going to read a duet of poems. I never read these poems, barely. So, um, these poems were inspired by Blue and Green by Miles Davis. Um, man, that makes me want to cut on some music while I read these, but I will, I will resist the urge to try to find music to turn on while I read my poems. I'll just read them to you. So um, there's this wonderful gentleman named Adam Tudor, who is a saxophone player, um, and he wanted to put together this show for Luminaria one year where we redo Blue and Green, the album, and he wanted me to narrate kind of the space of the poem and with through poetry. And so I turned on some some Miles Davis and wrote some poetry. And these are two of the poems. Um, and they're named after songs on the album. So a duet, part one, kind of blue. I will not change my color, for I have found the hue that suits me deeply. So what if I cannot understand? I have wet my reed and let the emotion bleed deep into my horn. I have found the frequency of forlorn, sitting juxtaposed to quarter note, tapping its toe. 
It is here where I place my pearls like a single white rose on a casket carved of the richest mahogany. I will place my pearls here below a lazy three-loader Freddy, Freddy three-loader, willfully slouching on the shoulder of melancholy. Those ivory keys cannot tickle me with falling. I will let my lip wilt down into a frown, rubbing blue and green, careening in a conversation only muted by trumpeting devastation. I will let the blast blanket me, softened bebop free, complexity stricken chords gone crazy over the top. I cannot afford such a frenetic exertion of sound. My tongue is tightly wound against my wounded palate, pushing air into this instrument, finding polyphony, blended beautifully to complement my fellow players. We are the purveyors of melodious whispers, unrestricted by measure. Using the mode as our muse, we captivate the frame of meter and time, verse and rhyme, pacing through legato, we meld into the climb, wide-eyed seeking the place where structure and improv align, strike a balance and pine. And all blues burst from the seams of bow and bell, yes, I have placed my prose here. I will eternally dwell, tipping my hat brim to the mellow scale of composition as I proposition Orpheus and Apollo alike to come and sit in with the band tonight. Let us plot our flight into a legendary realm that exceeds comprehension and compare. Sharp leaves rippling out, flamenco sketches out the binary code, so a spectrum of once subdued blues. Oh. That's part one. Pause for part two. Part two, all blues. Can we take this brass, paint it serene? Baby, let me fade your love blue and green. I used to taste your jazz. It was so supreme. Tertiary colors gradating the scene. Enviously, I watch. Jealously, Embedded within, I listen. The way you caress her bronze, curvaceous form, like passion gave you permission. You hold her neck in submission, whisper sweet nothings into a delicate, pouting mouthpiece. Tornadic winds been blowing in my mind. You crease the corners of my heart bent. Virtually, all your time is spent pressing her buttons. I want all or nothing. I am passionately possessive. My gaze arrests you like the police as I call for a cease and desist. But you can't resist the temptation to play with her. I beckon to you, but you stay miles away. I summon you, but you are afloat toward jagged rocks. Siren swayed, I beckon for you, my love, but you stay miles away. You foolish minstrel, can't you see? You blow your cool and she sets you free. I'm here when she goes silent. When the twilight fades into the wee hours, this art has got you captive under lock and key. You cower to the calling, falling beneath the brew and spell. I watch envy scaling my skin like a crocodile's tail. You wail one last note and cloak my heart in the dark. A rift that tears my pulp apart. <laughs> Super. Um, I'll, I will say that the video. Yeah, fantastic. Um, for those who stuck with us this long, thank you for being here. I just want to pop up. So in the comments down here uh, on this power, uh, just transition, energy justice, uh, remember, we're going to be uh, holding this uh, an online town hall here pretty soon, uh, next Thursday. I uh, want to invite everybody out to that. Here are the details. Our water, our power uh, town hall. So that's Thursday. Um, and here's a link. It's in the comments. So hopefully you can click or get it more easily through the comments. Um, we're just uh, closing out last few minutes um, and I do want to um, uh, let's see I think that's the update uh, down here 
you've probably seen this for a while, but maybe you haven't been to the website. Uh, we post all these videos in full up on the website as well as our YouTube channel. So uh, regrettably, we had to cut into to Meredith's interview and there were some great thoughts and very personal thoughts at the end of that conversation. Um, so I hope you will come over to the, to the site there uh, and check that out. And if you are able, um, the last uh, request uh, I would make is uh, direct, just directing folks over to our Patreon page. Um, we're really, uh, I've got some support on my end, my partner, Marisol Cortez. Um, uh, we'd like to, to, to bring her in and make her work possible. We've got Breaking Gear. Um, we've got Need to uh, Incorporate as a nonprofit. Uh, and just and and really kind of continue to invest in this project. Um, so uh, thank thank you to everyone who's who's tuned in. Uh, we'll continue our work uh, and like I said, upcoming conversations uh, about domestic violence uh, in San Antonio and beyond, mental health issues, uh, and and a, and a range of uh, of other conversations. We've got an excellent meditation teacher coming in on our next broadcast that I'm. I'm really, really excited about um, uh, responding to that epidemic of despair. Um, I think all of us could use a way or tools to settle ourselves, to cool down um, our, what is it, hypothalamus, what is it, the top of the spine somewhere. Um, that's what I'm talking about. So anyway, thank you. Uh, and, and again, in, in the, the comments, we really do want this to be a space for uh, community cohesion, binding together, building out power. We can't uh, simply uh, drift through, suffer through uh, the neglect and the hardship of this time, uh, hoping in, in the, that somehow the powers that be will be um, uh, coming to the rescue as much as we can uh, doing uh, the, the mutual assistance, mutual aid, as much as we can, um, planning and expecting, uh, anticipating what's around the curve uh, and I have no doubt in my mind that if we do that together, uh, that we will get through uh, stronger and be able to make a, a huge um, actually rebound because we know what's existed here. Uh, but in previous to uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus epi uh, pandemic uh, was a broken and inequitable system to say the least. And we are seeing uh, that manifested, seeing that revealed in its ugliest form uh, in this moment. Uh, and so not only do we need to kind of pull through together and find our way into, you know, like here's where the food distribution, all that kind of stuff. I want to try to share that and share that through deceleration uh, because we do have this infrastructure in place. Uh, but I want to make sure also that people are feeling connected, uh, that we maintain our social connections and that we build our power uh, in community. Uh, if it has to be online, so be it. That's where we are at right now. Um, but, but again, the comments are open to you. If you have a need, if you are alone, if you just uh, are, are, are low, uh, please put them into the comments. Don't be uh, embarrassed. Uh, I'll try to do uh, likewise. Uh, it's definitely, it's been an incredibly hard time for, for many, uh, more than myself for sure. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we want to support and lift up one another. So thanks again, uh, much respect and much gratitude, uh, until next time.